Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion, creating our own table. We are so excited to learn from our panelists and in community with all of you. Thank you so much for arriving in this digital space with us. My name is Emma. My pronouns are she and her. I am the marketing and programming director at Ant Loot Books, a nonprofit intersectional feminist press. Uh, before we get into the core of this event, I want to make some quick announcements. First, this event is being recorded and it will be published shortly after today so that we can continue to share the resources and the stories that arise. This event is made possible by funds from the California Arts Council. Uh, and there will be a Q&A portion at the end of this panel. So if you have further questions for our panelists, you can input them into the Q&A function of Zoom. And you can find that button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And now I wanna take a moment to recognize that we at Ant Loot do our work of uplifting marginalized voices and striving toward justice via the written word on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ohlone people who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. And so as guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. And I invite you all to share if you know the land acknowledgements of wherever you might be calling in from in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce our collaborators and the visionaries behind this project, Pallavi Davon and Tamika Thompson of POC United. Hi everyone, I am so excited you all are here today. I'm Tamika Thompson, I'm co-creator of POC United and fiction editor of our group's anthology, Graffiti. I wanna thank the California Arts Council for their support of this project uh, and of the POC United mission and for all of you uh, for attending. The POC United mission is really simple. We want people of color to see ourselves as one group. We want people of color to read one another. And as artists of color ourselves, we want to free ourselves to write outside of the white gaze. Quite often, when artists of color set off in our careers, we are focused on building legitimacy, which very often travels through white gatekeepers, agents, editors, publishers, book reviewers, who then market us and our work to white readers. But we at POC United believe that we can build community, find audience and distribute our work to one another, which put another way means if you're here because you're a fan of the work by Dr. Betts, you can now check out the Kaya Press catalog. If you are a Kaya Press reader in attendance today, you wanna be sure to check out uh, work that is coming out of Black Freighter Press. People of color are all one group. I know I keep saying it, but we can and we should write for one another and read one another. We are our own legitimacy. Uh, and now I wanna introduce you to my POC United co-creator, Pallavi Dovin, who will tell you more about today's panel, the topic today, uh, and introduce our wonderful moderator. Thank you, Tamika. Hello, everyone. I'm Pallavi Dovin. I am thrilled to be here. I think Tamika captured the mission of POC United perfectly. Um, and I want to um, not take up too much more time before you hear from the panelists, because they are really the representatives um, of what it means to create your own space on your own terms. And um, by doing that, they've set an example for the rest of us to find our way in the literary world. Um, and so this is a really exciting opportunity. These panelists are inspirational and they have so much um, 
to share with all of you. And I'm really excited too about our moderator, Pendarvis Harshaw, who is an inspiration in his own right, doing amazing work. Um, Pendarvis is a journalist from Oakland. He is a graduate of Howard University's School of Communication, and he is um, a graduate of UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. He's the director of the documentary film TDK, The Dream Continues with a K, and the author of OG Told Me, a coming of age memoir about his upbringing in Oakland, California. Pendarvis currently works at KQED, where he writes about arts and culture in Northern California and hosts a radio show and podcast, which I encourage you all to check out if you haven't already, called Right Nowish. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Pendarvis to um, get into this discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pendarvis, and to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. That was an amazing introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, again, my name is Pendarvis Harshaw, journalist from Oakland, California. Uh, glad to be here. Excited to talk about literature, literacy, and how we can all uh, play our part in making sure that um, all boats rise. And so um, without further ado, I think it's great to just go ahead and jump on in it. You know, um, let's, let's get these introductions started. I wanted to start off with uh, introducing, first and foremost, Dr. Tara Betts. Uh, Dr. Tara Betts is, um, there, there's a nice image of her. Uh, the force behind the Whirlwind Center in Chicago, um, which actually just launched a Kickstarter to um, find support. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But uh, Dr. Tara Betts is going to be joining us as well as uh, Nila Jana Banarji. I know I butchered your name because I know you as Nila and I've known you for years. And so saying your full name is actually new to me. Um, <laughs> But Neela is at Kaya Press, uh, managing editor, as well as a writer of all sorts. Um, we're going to jump into how you can just hold so many different hats. I'm really interested to talk about that. And uh, last but not least is Tango Eisen Martin, who I've recently interviewed uh, as a part of the Right Nowish uh, program. And uh, he's a writer, educator, um, a poet, the uh, one of the most renowned poets out of the region. Um, and just looking forward to talking more about how he's taken his work in poetry and his acclaim and now launched uh, the Black Freighter Press. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> all right, I think we can get it started. Um, we can just start with how are you doing? Um, and I'll, I'll go backwards, starting with you, Tonga. I'm cool. Um, you know, just, uh, uh, just trying to... Uh, Take it one conversation at a time, one one little slice of the to do list at a time. But I'm I'm feeling good. Good to hear you. Good. Good to hear you. Good. Uh, Neela, how are you feeling? I'm so excited to be here. Um, I love Aunt Loot. It was probably one of the first small presses that I got to know. Uh, they published in 1993. I had to look it up. An uh, anthology of South Asian writers. Uh, women's voices called Our Feet Walk the Sky. And I have distinct memories of being in high school and just finding myself for the first time in literature. So now I don't know if at that time I knew I would end up in publishing, but it feels great. And then I got to be a part of a another great Aunt Luth, Aunt Luth anthology that came out uh, several years ago called Good Girls Marry Doctors. And um, and it's great to, to be here. Thank you for that. Uh, Tara, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, the weather's nice and I, you know, I'm healthy. I got my first vaccine shot. A lot of people in Chicago are looking forward to that. So I'm grateful, you know. Ty, good to hear. Yeah, sunshine and vaccine. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, now that the ice is broken, we set our pleasant trees. Let's just go ahead and get all into it. I would love to know where you are right now as a writer and how did you get started? So just give us a little bit about who you are right now, but really um, the emphasis is on, you know, that first step. And keep in mind that the audience is full of people who might want to get that first step started. Hmm. I'm sorry, and I'll start with Anila. All right. Um, yeah, I think um, I started as a writer, it was, I, as a reader, something that I was always, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. I'm from the Midwest. 
uh, and I was a reader, a writer, always interested in those things. I arrived in San Francisco uh, in the year 2000, ready to be a journalist, ready to, to, to get out there and, and just be a writer. And uh, I, I, you know, was a journalist for several years. I, I got my MFA from San Francisco State University uh, at the same time that I was working with uh, the amazing youth media organization, Yo Youth Outlook, uh, where I met Penn and uh, just met a, you know, I think those being able to take some time to really read and study writing while I was working with young people to tell their own stories has, I think those two things really solidified that just the rest of my life, that's my path. I, I, I can't separate the, the, my own writing, trying to tell the stories of my, of, of myself, my family, Asian Americans, South Asian Americans with also at the same time, trying to share all of that knowledge with young people, with community members. Um, and I think that's really led thankfully, like miraculously uh, when I landed in Los Angeles, um, you know, about nine years ago, I got connected to the work I do now. So I feel like for me, it's always been luckily this path of, of trying to put it down on the page and then at the same time, share share that knowledge with others. You touched on a couple of points that I know we're gonna come back to in terms of telling your own story, working with community and also being involved with institutions. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, uh, Tara, how'd you get started? What was your first step? You know, in some ways, I think we have a similar path, Ms. Neela. Um, I feel like I started doing teaching artist work in Chicago with a few organizations. And once I got really immersed in working with young Chicago authors, um, I've really started to think about how when you teach, you have to like break stuff down into steps for people. So it made me think about how would I walk myself through doing something and then also still reminding myself to be open, you know, to not just a variety of voices, but like, just cause I do it this way doesn't mean you have to do it this way. You know, I think you have to have that kind of <coughs> flexibility when you do that. But at the same time, I was also going to a lot of open mics. I was slamming. I was, you know, I feel like a lot of young people now who are involved with the poetry slam community have figured out you have to wear many, many hats if you want to be out in the world and they've mastered that and social media so well that it's not an anomaly anymore to do that. But when I did it back at the beginning of the 21st century, God, it sounds so old. Um, <laughs> that's kind of what we did. You know, you had to do that. You had to hustle. And then I moved to New York and I was kind of doing that. And that's how I met Tongo. I was teaching and doing teaching artist work in New York with Urban Word and a few other places. So Thank there you. you met pretty uh, Looks like we're losing you, Tara. One second. Uh, I'm sorry, if you could repeat that final point. We, we lost your little slight connection. Okay. Is it good? We hear you loud and clear. Just the, literally the last sentence. I think that's all we lost. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, that it's a, an act of persistence, right? Like you, you go out, you meet people, you go to events, you participate, you be a good literary citizen. Maybe you organize readings and, you know, you're sending out work and sharing poems with people and going to workshops, you know, all of that stuff was really, it felt like a cauldron of activities and things that I was just immersed in. What a novel idea, be in community. Like what, who the thunk, you know, just get out there, shake hands, make friends. Like it works, yeah, it works. It does. Actually like sh show the world who you are, they might like you. Right. Yeah. Like, I remember, I'm going to be short because I know we got to get to Tongo. I won't be rude. But I just thought about this idea of being at Dodge Poetry Festival. And if you've ever been, it's in New Jersey. It's a predominantly white audience that goes to it, but a very diverse cross-section of poets. And we did this panel and I was trying to explain to people, it was like, yeah, there was a whole community in Chicago in the late 90s and early aughts that was black, Asian, Latino, and there were Native American poets at one point. 
and they just didn't believe us. Like I kept telling them like, no, we did shows together at this place, this place, this place. And we published here, here, here. They couldn't believe it. So I think creating that space, it's, it's so important for us and for people to know that, yes, we do talk to each other. We're not all, <laughs> you know, in, in the throes of not liking each other or in conflict, like popular culture would sometimes like to depict. Thank you for that. Thank you. Tongo, spotlight on you. Question <laughs> is, first step, how'd you get started in the game? Um, I, I, if I, if, if, uh, if if there's anything kind of actionable <laughs> I could pass along, uh, I, I benefited greatly from just uh, being around uh, great um, writers. Um, rest in peace, uh, Mums the Schemer, who who just recently passed away. Um, and and I and I and I think of him. I I didn't I didn't know him, but he was like the first when I got to New York. He was the first guy I saw really walk on water. You know. And uh, that 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 really was the you know the the first ten steps of education right there. Just watching people um, set set a, set a, set a, a, a biblical example. Um, also, what what I think what helped my craft was uh, spending a lot of time away from careerism, um, operating in kind of uh, operating in in in, in various obscurities. <laughs> Uh, and, and therefore, putting constructing a practice um, with, with, within that trench um, uh, basically gave me the um, you know gave, gave me the, the the muscles of of, uh, of evolution um, that that keep um, you know uh, how, how I put it like, keep keep my craft involved in a. In, in a pra in a praxis of of how can I take any leverage I get my hands on and make it collective, um, and, and and also just kind of a to have a a world away from um, uh, uh, imitating yourself, right? And, and, and these kind of uh, uh, weird mind games uh, it ha has been crucial for my development, and and also just again to you know to to be engaging um you know to be engaging in the in the world uh, engaging the world not as an individual and not worry so much about my individual journey but rather you know the, what what's the what's what's the bigger picture what's the bigger or at, at the very least what's the bigger cultural um picture so kind of like being um held hostage by mandates other than individual accomplishment has been uh, cru crucial for my development, and I think keeps you know keeps the writing interesting. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for that. I love. I wrote down uh, various obscurities just because I think that like might be my next tattoo or something like that. Like <laughs> that, that's the words right there. Um, but of those various obscurities, those multiple hats that uh, was mentioned earlier that we need to wear. Uh, Tar, I believe you're the one that said that many hats. Um, everyone here on this panel has been involved with or is involved with institutions, you know, um, UCLA, uh, SF State Mills, uh, Rutgers, and also uh, multiple universities in Chicago. And I'm wondering, what's the importance of being involved in uh, institutions of higher learning when it comes to having your writing seen? And I'll start with uh, Neela. Yeah, I mean, for for me, I you know, for Kaya Press, it's, it's really, practical. Kaya Press uh, is, is 27 years old this year, so I definitely didn't have anything to do with founding it, but I uh, have been working there uh, since I moved to LA about nine years ago. And Kaya Press was founded in New York City in the mid-90s um, and, you know, was, was the new kid on the block, did a lot of stuff. Then uh, our offices were below Canal Street uh, during 9-11. Uh, we, we were locked out of there for a while. And then uh, the publisher of Kaya, Sun Yang Lee, who I am just, you know, really a voice for, is kept the press alive for, for almost 10 years by herself. She moved to California to get her MFA at UC Irvine and literally just kept the press alive. There was no one else, but she was still doing the work. 
And then in 2011, we got housed at the University of Southern California in the American Studies Department. And just that little bit of, of foundational support, uh, we are a, a nonprofit press, but we have uh, a, a small space, two offices, which we haven't seen this year, but a little bit of space. We have a little bit of funding and we get a graduate research assistant. Um, and that has allowed us to stabilize. And, you know, um, do I think that the University of Southern California matches our values most of the time? No, I do not. Um, but, you know, we found this home there and they do support us and it's really allowed us in the time that I've come on to the press to stabilize, to, to relaunch in Los Angeles, a city that it seems like is a, is a really great place for an Asian American press. And then I, over the last five or six years, have gotten the opportunity to teach writing, creative writing, and in the last couple of years, a, a class that I'm teaching right now focused on Asian American publishing, which is really just a chance for me to talk to students about how to critique mainstream publishing and how it is a white supremacist space. Uh, and I love, I love being in, that's a class, I love UCLA. It's an Asian American studies department that has started the, you know, one of the originators along with SF State and Berkeley. And, um, you know, so, so those institutions are, are so important for me and I can really see, you know, the, the, the positives of, of partnering, but I do love that we are able to be an independent nonprofit press amongst them. Great answer, because that's exactly what I was asking. How do you navigate that? Like, you don't want to compromise your voice, but uh, at the same time, there are benefits to it, um, to working with institutions, um, both USC and UCLA, in your instance. Uh, Tara, uh, how about yourself? Um, the institutions that you work with, uh, some of the benefits and detriments. Sorry, there's a four-year-old next to me who needs me. <laughs> hey, four-year-old. <laughs> I always love that. I feel like sometimes if you at least acknowledge the kid, then they get nervous. They don't want to be like, I'll be quiet now. But, <laughs> you know, let them say hi. Um, at least for me, I think my aspirations later in my teaching artist career was that I did want to become a full-time college professor. Um, <laughs> now I have different thoughts, but um, I do think there is an important role for faculty of color. Um, I recently spoke with Joshua Bennett's class where he teaches at Dartmouth. And um, I told the students there, they were like, why aren't you teaching at a university? And you don't wanna go off and talk about what search committees are like and all this other business. So I told them, I said, look, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes for people to even get that job in the first place. You get the PhD, you publish the books, you win the awards. It does not mean that you'll get in the door. That's just like a ticket for the lottery, basically. And you pay a lot for that ticket. And I said, if you have a professor of color who is an ally for you or like Dr. Bennett, you know, where they support you, please understand there are a lot of struggles that they undertake that they may never tell you about and they can't tell you about. And Joshua just sat there and he kind of smiled. I know he wanted to nod his head probably, but <laughs> that's been my experience. And for me, I find that I like young people too much. I like students too much because I don't want to represent the interests of the university anymore. Like, I just know it's like ingrained in me. So they just see me coming and I've been in the interviews and, you know, I'll be like, I know their books. I'll be like, oh, that last article you wrote on such and such. And it's like, they just look at me like an anomaly. Like, you know too much and you've done too much, right? <laughs> like I've heard <laughs> Tanaya Winder talk about that. You know, when she was like, I've been applying for jobs and people have told me I do too much, which is really a danger for people of color going into the university. They'll be like, you have all this stuff on your resume. When we've all been taught, you know, you don't work hard enough or you've been taught like, you know, we, we've been parented by Papa Pope where we're like, you got to work twice as hard to get half as much. And then they get to that point where they tell you, no, you do too much. And I was just like, I got so fed up with that. I was like, how can I start doing this work and not be fettered 
Or what would it be like if I could teach what I really want to teach as opposed to teaching composition and then I have to shoehorn things that are very valuable for me to teach as a writer, right? So I think I've just, you know, recently in my teaching, I've been asking those questions a lot. <coughs> that balance and that compromise, and then especially from the edu educator side of things, um, I want to come back to you after I asked Tango about it, but um, the, the work that you're doing in creating an actual physical space speaks to some way to, you know, not give into that compromise, I imagine. Um, see, I see the head nod, I'm gonna get back to it, but I wanna hear Tongo address this because I, we've talked about this kind of off the record about you navigating uh, some of the institutions in the Bay Area. And so I'd, I'd love to hear more about your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, as a, as a writer, you know, um, I, 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 I actually am a late bloomer um, with, uh, with, with uh, you know, with a life in, in, in these institutions. Um, I, I came up through black studies, you know, um, and, and that was, you know, that, that was kind of like, that was the universe that got me through as I promise you without, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have the stomach for any of that, for anything else this, this college had to um, offer any of these, uh, you know, basically, uh, uh, well, white supremacy or uh, white supremacist uh, fantasy factories of, of departments that I that I encountered um and so you know when it comes when it came to poetry I, I'm really more of a kind of a a, 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 play, a playground <laughs> a playground player than a, uh you know than, than than in the arena um you know on, on the back end it's kind of my presence matured a little bit out out here uh, I, I got to teach in, in some universities, and, and it's cool. It's it's it, it, it's cool. It's not a, a bad place to incubate, um, you know, kind of the the dance with language is people that just you know they love it, you know, um, or or are held hostage by it. Um, that just the, the 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 danger is just is is kind of the um, the, the 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 stamp. And, and, and it's and it's and it's almost a, it's 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 kind of the softer side of 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 the way uh, the the ruling class reproduces its hegemony, you know, not just by you know the heavy-handed coercion that you see out of a military-industrial complex or a cost of living, but also in the kind of like the aspiration that well, I, I'm not really uh, you're not really doing it until you are performing or teaching in an endowed building right <laughs> so you're not you're not really doing it until you're um, you know really without in some ways a ruling class permission um and so while you know i think so far so good um now we we we, we definitely need to move um at the at the very least, um, move move our our um, you know our stamps of, of what is a you know what is a successful uh, poet or writer uh, uh, away from 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 their clutches because it is it's in it one it's it it's it, it's diluting uh, because it does reduce everything to an individual a adventure and it's also inhibiting because it does you know concentrate power into you know bureaucratic hands and it can even be like a loving bureaucratic hand you know or, or uh, you know so, or even when, when you know when one of us has the job you know what I mean? but but still that that um that 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 equation that that process undermines you know the potential of of poetry um, really having a life with the mass imagination is it's really not supposed to be a, a niche. Is it niche or niche? <laughs> we feel you. <laughs> but no, I really like. I wanted to, you know, punch a punch a wall. Like you just said, that stamp and that stamp. Like again, I met Neela as a youth journalist. And, and, 
Come here. Say hi. Do you want to talk? Say hi. Say hi. I want to talk. All right, go. <laughs> um, I met Neela as a youth journalist. And for a long time, that stamp followed me as a youth journalist, you know? And I had to apply and pay for the stamp of a professional journalism school, which put me in debt. And there are a lot of people who aren't willing to take those risks in terms of those loans. I bet on myself to say, hey, you know, I will have a profession in journalism, but um, I actually had to appeal to that like white supremacist high, higher institution of, of learning. Um, Tara, I wanted to turn back to you and ask you about creating an institution, a physical space, because we're talking about um, creating community for writers and people who want to get into the, the work or are in the work and need community, you know, to be around folks. What's the importance of creating physical space um, that doesn't have that stamp that Tango talked about? Well, for me, it's saying that I have a lot of leeway, leeway and a lot of freedom to make the kind of decisions that I want to make without having to answer to the people who want to give me a stamp. I know I'm completely capable and, you know, I've taught in other people's MFA programs and stuff at this point. And I just feel like you want me, you want to pay me a fraction of what these students are paying to learn what I could give them. And then you act like you're not interested in what I'm teaching, right? I was teaching the last MFA program I was in, I taught seminars on June Jordan, Bob Kaufman, and who was the third person? I can't remember right now off the top of my head, but it was a series of writers of color, which was what they wanted me to do. But then they would do things like schedule a panel on fiction writing, you know, or how to sell your book. So there was definitely some, some conflicts in terms of what you say you want and what you really want students to attend, right? And <clears throat> there were not a lot of people in that program who were teaching work by writers of color. And it was very problematic to me because I would do interdisciplinary stuff. The other people would be like, here are two strategies you can use and here is some essays you can read. And I was bringing all this stuff, you know, and it, it felt very much like a surface kind of thing and I don't even get to go deep with it. Cause you know, if you teach a seminar, you're, you wanna, you could be like, I could teach you all the books. We could talk about the critics and the different things that they've said about the work. We could talk about what they innovated, right? And how that impacted the community they were in. What are some of those larger themes? Why were they writing about this stuff? Like I could go into it and when I've had, particularly when I was teaching at Chicago State, I did a lot of classes where it was predominantly or all black there. So we could talk about all the nitty gritty of Gwendolyn Brooks in a seminar. And there's no questioning it. They wanna talk about colorism. They wanna talk about sexual assault. They wanna talk about, I feel like they, you know, it was a struggle with some of the critical writing, but they weren't afraid of it because they knew the door was open to talk about everything, right? And I think you have to feel like you have that kind of environment, not just to challenge the kind of stuff that Tongo was describing, but <laughs> there is something to be said for professors of color being in those kinds of spaces that are a little bit stifling because there's so many marginalized young people who feel like they're unsupported completely. And then that gets into the whole emotional labor that professors of color have to undertake that they're white counterparts don't always have to undertake because who are they gonna go to, right? Even I would get, it would, I wouldn't just get black students, I get Latino students, the gay students would come to me. I really haven't had a professor like you, you're different, right? So if that conversation happens, something's missing from the learning process because you're supposed to get a variety. Like when I was an undergrad, I wish I had a professor like Tongo because that's what I thought I might get. I might get the white guy with the leather patches on the jacket, but I might also get a professor who's gonna challenge me to think a little bit differently, right? Or they're gonna be a little quirky or they're gonna be artsy. I thought it would be, a, and it wasn't like that. 
And it's still not like that. Uh, Nila, so you're nodding. Did you have something that you wanted to add to that? Um, no, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's so powerful to, you know, have be able to have classes. I feel so lucky. Uh, I remember I, I mean, I got, I got my MFA at San Francisco State, uh, which is this amazing school full of working class people, but the MFA, <laughs> which I didn't really think about was super white, uh, you know, and I understand that now. And, um, you know, even, and it was an affordable place, but it was, it was so challenging to kind of have that in, in my creative spaces for a long time. And then also when I started teaching uh, creative writing classes as well, a lot of the students would be white. And then I got to UCLA and they have had this Asian American creative writing class in the department that they've had for, for years. Because when Asian American studies was founded, it really was founded as scholarship, community, and arts. A lot of the ethnic studies were, and a lot of them have moved away from that. They've Everything's become so professionalized. But they still hang on to that. And I, I walked into this classroom in fall of 2016, which was such a, a, an emotional time. And they, I think because it is outside of an English department or in creative writing department, they didn't know that it was kind of a, it set up like a workshop. And I got hired in August, it started the next month. And, and they accidentally filled it with 42 students, which is double <laughs> any kind of creative writing workshop. But it was my first class. So, you know, I was like, I'm right on top of that. You know, I wasn't gonna do anything. And I walked into the class that first day and it was this room that you couldn't move the tables. They were all bolted into the floor. So everything is like anti the classes that I've ever been in or taught. But I'll tell you what, every student in that class was a student of color and I cried. I cried when they put their heads down to, to do their first little writing exercise because it was such a blessing. And yeah, they eventually kind of got me some help with the TA and stuff, but it was incredible. And I've been able to, and, I, and, and part of my job was to only teach Asian American writers and writers of color. And, you know, that I've been doing that now for five years, along with the work at Kaya. And so being able to, to, to work in a way that, that switches it to just teach a regular creative writing class, but be given the space to teach it with the writers of that have moved me in these communities has, has just been life-changing. And I feel so lucky. And I, you know, have wanted in this time to talk to more places or more places doing this. Is it a possibility? You know, it's, it's just such a little, you know, a, a small change. What if you could offer a few classes like this, both in institutions and in community spaces and at libraries, you know, it just, it just, uh, it was, it's, it was such a powerful experience. Thank you for sharing that. That's something that um, in a broader sense, I've had experience with where getting myself established um, before approaching an institution has benefited me drastically, where they understand who I am, the following that I have, what I'm interested in. And when I get to that institution, they carve out that niche or niche or whatever for me. Um, and um, and everybody's benefited from it, you know, like the community that I cover, myself, um, and obviously the institution. Um, that said, I want to pivot, jump into something a little heavier, um, and we're going to jump into a, group questions, or excuse me, um, audience questions after this question, more or less. Um, but this is the one that I think a lot of people are interested in is like, how do you make money off of writing? You know, I'm talking to three professionals, people who made money off of writing, clear across the board. Like, let's talk about the bag. Like, uh, Tar, I saw you laughing. <laughs> what? No, I cringed. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> misinterpretation. Uh -huh. For me, it has been a, a constant balancing act. Um, in particular, because I did not think I would be at my current age, which I don't want to say, but post PhD, two books published in a bunch of places. And I'm still not full time anywhere. Like I thought that was the vision, right? And then I'm realiz realizing how much of that is really like a working class thing because my parents didn't go to college. So, you know, you figure you put in your shift, you go home, right? Or my parents, when they were alive, they looked at the kind of jobs that, oh, Tara teaches. They didn't think poetry was a job. 
They didn't think writing was a job. Tar be teaching the kids. That's what they would tell people, right? <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I, I, I balanced so many teaching jobs before I left Chicago, it wouldn't be unusual for me to be in six places in a five day work week. I would pick up gigs where I would go read. I'd always have a bag with my books in it. I got to the point where I figured out how to use the credit card swipe so I could get more money because you make more money with, you know, cards than cash now. You know, you would just pick up all of those things like that. So you're constantly thinking of ways to generate money. And it's really interesting now to hear all these other people start to talk about, you need multiple streams of income. I'm like, hell, if you're a writer, you're always thinking of that, right? You know, I've even seen some people, they put their book up on Spotify and record the tracks. So people, if they play it, it's not like it's free <laughs> when somebody else posts it on their YouTube and you don't make any money off of it, you know? And even if you have your own YouTube channel, you have to hit a certain plateau and create a lot of content to make money off that. So it's like, <laughs> I make money now primarily off of doing workshops and organizing things. I've curated events um, and doing editing projects. So every day, even on a lazy day, I'm doing something. And I think that's important to remember. And it's not always writing related stuff, you know? Like some people are really good where they do that hour of writing a day or whatever, or, and then they go, they go to the grind. And I think that's probably a more realistic approach to the work. Thank you for that. Yeah, multiple hats again, you know, and having multiple streams of revenue. I wanted to uh, follow up with you before moving on to everybody else, um, specifically with Whirlwind Press. Um, what's the work that you are doing, doing right now? Well, it's not a press. Um, Right now, I started on it at the at the very beginning of the pandemic because there was a building <laughs> that's on the south side. <laughs> I would pass by it all the time and I happened to see it go up for sale. Little did I know by the time I almost had the deposit, the owner had sold it. So we raised all this money and now we're looking for a new building. So we've been looking for a building, but then my board, cause I assembled a board, my board members helped me file for 501c3 status. And we did the fundraising campaign. So we're almost at $50,000, which would put us at a 20% deposit for a building of about 250K in Chicago. And that was the goal. However, because we wanna be based on the South side and the city is still one of the most segregated cities in the country, the housing infrastructure is just in the toilet. So we've been looking at buildings, it'll be like 200K and it's falling apart and going into the ground. So it's interesting to see how the gentrification will hold you up even if you have money, right? So, it's been a little bit of a holdup, but not necessarily because we've been able to do virtual events and we're going to be doing virtual writing workshops soon. So at least people can do that and know that things are in progress. And we're hoping to partner with some spaces that already exist and before we get the space. Gotcha. Whirlwind Center, I should say, to be yeah. clear. Thank you. Thank you for that. Best of luck. That's a, a heavy lift, but it's definitely tangible. So looking forward to seeing that to come come to fruition. Well, um, that sounds good, though. But I think <laughs> Lamont Steptoe has whirlwind press. <laughs> Noted. Noted. Tango, how do you go about um, generating revenue through writing? And the bag. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, and and I'm not. This is this is. I'm not. I'm not talking to you live from the other side of the rainbow. <laughs> but but uh, you know, um, it, it, you kind of just piece it together. You know, um, between um, gigs and teaching and 
you know, whatever the residency you might come up on along the way. Um, you know, Steve Martin wasn't lying though. You know, how, how, how do you, how, how do you, how, how do you become a, you know, how do you get on? Uh, you be undeniably good. You know, I, I, I kind of wandered into a lot of this stuff. I didn't know where a lot of it was at. And I found just kind of a, a, a strength of, a strength of craft will kind of pull that little slice of the universe towards you. Um, but I hate, <laughs> I hate to say, I hate to, I, 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 I hate to be the bearer of this, this kind of news, but I, I, I think, you know, ultimately there's not enough for everyone. Um, there are like, there are a hundred of me, you know, uh, who, who won't, you know, who, who won't get the same, who won't get the same access. And so, you know, any day now, a, a generation is gonna have to put together an, a, a new paradigm and, and, and just move away from the move away from the money thing. Uh, genuinely, uh, this, this kind of what what precipitated a kind of a um, uh, what precipitated a batch of poems that brought me a little bit of a bag was actually a, 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 a time where I'd never been broker. That's where that's where these poems were were created. Not only uh, it, it broke, but also uh, didn't even really have a lot of access to any cultural institution, um, even local. Um, and 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 so it's something about making you know if if you take your praxis away from the the the, the, the money paradigm, yeah, I, I think I think we'll do will do better or at the very least like we, at a certain point somebody's going to have to do the heavy lifting of uh, 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 transforming the way art is really facilitated in the, in, the, in the mass imagination so like with, with the Black Freighter Press you know what our ultimate objective actually is not just to become a worker on cooperative or author on cooperative but actually like a, what they call it, a consumer cooperative right so it is. It, it actually uh, uh, belongs to, you know, a, 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 as many people as we can call the masses as, as 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 possible. That we we have to be brought in that, brought in from the cold that way. Otherwise, you know, no matter how groovy one of us, uh, uh, no matter how groovy a walk one of us gets to take, it's just not fair. And it's not. And it's and it's and it's and it's and it's not. It's not enough. And, it, and and we also see how, um, you know, our, our, our current kind of just like orientation um, to, to success um, ha, has left the biosphere in shambles, right? Like the question is how many, like how many bags are even left before this dystopia slides into kind of like a, a harsher chapter of the movie, you know what I mean? So it, that, now I'm not trying to I'm I'm not trying to be cute or undermine anybody's aspirations or even interfere in in, in anyone's fate, um, and you know, even like the you know revolutionaries have told me like well, you're supposed to keep a job, you know, you, you, and and but but I just don't want us to confuse the the bag with your actual revolutionary potential. With, with, and with our cultural potentials or our, our potentials as, as cultural cultural workers. But the short answer, just like, I mean, or the, practic the practical answer, uh, you know, just really, really get, just, you know, put that time in the thousands and thousands of pages and, um, and, and, and then you just kind of just, you know, you, you piece it, you piece it together. Um, gotcha. Until, until the big train comes and picks you up. <laughs> <laughs> until it just starts raining money. But no, you said it. You said it. The bag isn't the end goal. You know, keep that in mind. Um, right. And in a cap capitalistic society, it always seems as such. But no, it's about the influence or the revolution or what, what you hold in your heart. Um, and I wanted to ask you more specifically uh, with the work with a Black Freighter. What's the work that you all are doing? Well, you know, we're just taking it one book or three books at a time. Uh, we, we, we I, I actually, you know, and, and what, what kind of, um, you know, what, what kind of bullied me 
uh, into into seeing the idea through <laughs> was uh, the, the the first three books that we're putting out. You know, um, one one cat uh, uh, Josiah Luis out of that day, just like really a holy man <laughs> masquerading as a poet, uh, and, and just needed. You know, he's been doing so much for culture in the Bay for so long. He 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 needs his book. Need his book. Actually, I'm. You can't see all the boxes, but they just we just got it. We just got a big shipment. Um, and, and then this cat named QR Hand Jr., who was just like one of the giants who got away, you know, like pound for pound, you can put him up with um, uh, with any of the greats. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away on New Year's Eve, but we were able to finish the, his manuscript before he passed away. So, you know, that's you know, that's the honor. And then also, we uh, putting out a book. A cat named Christopher Malik, who's doing life in in prison in in Florida, um, and we want to put every slate. We're going to put a, an incarcerated um, writer out. So you know, you got a let. You have a you have a you have a legend, uh, a, a late legend, a cat doing life, and you got you know, walking perfect karma. You have to <laughs> you have to see it. You have to see it through. So you know. Uh, that, 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 that's all that, that, that's all I mean along the way we we have some kind of we, we have a monthly reading that we we, we want that we want to do and, and other kind of like workshop ideas and, and these type of things but we we really just trying to do right by the authors one book at a time thank you for that there's been a request for you to hold the book up if possible if it's accessible <laughs> The perfect, mirror perfect. of text. You don't know which way is right. Which way is left. <laughs> Hold up, wait, let me get right. There, there you go. Yeah, Baby we can see it. Photos and old pochos, you know. Uh, oh. Who uh, Juan Felipe Pereira, <laughs> Lord of the United States, and has stamped in this nice essay on the back of the book. <laughs> nice, nice. No, Thank yeah, you, for that uh, you get, you know. Uh, you can go to blackfighterpress.com and and, uh, and order it there. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Tongo. Um, I see we're piling up questions from the q and I want to make sure we have time for that, but I definitely want to ask Neela about how do you go about generating revenue through writing? <laughs> Yes, th uh, thank you for this question. I think we could have a whole panel. There should be lots of panels. Let's all talk about this. It's so important. It's not talked about enough. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's the, it's a hustle for sure. Uh, I've been thinking about it a lot this past year. Of, I have two young children under the age of six. Um, and I probably, I worked more this past year than I ever have, according to my taxes. Um, and uh, it made me really sad <laughs> because I was like, I'm more, oh, that's why I'm so damn tired because <laughs> um, I didn't have childcare really either. So I was like, wow, that's that's so wild. I had probably like four or five jobs <laughs> last year. Um, and, and but they, they were all inspiring, you know? So maybe that's the trade-off, right? I didn't have that one, the big bag. <laughs> so I had a lot of little bags that I, ma I made it work. And, and I think, you know, it's, and I, I, I've, it's always been like that. I've always been working nonprofit jobs and freelancing and, and, and I, I, I've found it to, to, to work for me to, to do that hustle, to, to learn in this way. And it's, it's, it's powerful. And, Exciting, and I think a big part. Of my Sun Young Lee, the publisher of Kaya, came to talk to my publishing students yesterday, and she talked about this idea because of college students. A lot of them are graduating. They asked this question too, and she said, for her, there was a moment where she separated her how to make a living from, um, you know, what she wanted to do in the world, the impact that she wanted to make, and I think that's that's an important thing to think about as you go forward. Um, and then to, and, and what Tonga was saying, how do we change this? I've been really inspired lately by presses who have open source. Uh, they, they, you can buy their books, but you can also just read them. Like I think inherently if, if, if we've learned anything this past year and this past, you know, a hundred years, the, the system has to change. We have to change the way we can't, you know, get a seat at the table and, and copy copy, you know, make a new table. We have to dismantle the table 
and reconstruct it to look like a spaceship, right? Like we have to change the way we're we're doing things. And so I think that's that's the the key. And I'm I'm so inspired. I'm really trying to gather a list of those people. Like there's this press called the Operating System out of New York, uh, run by a person named Eli that that I'm really inspired by. You know that that is they're always talking about this kind of stuff. I'm looking for those models. It's hard to jump into those models and and figure it out. But just what Tongo is saying too, like you know making it a, a worker owned, you know consumer run. Those things are are so important. So if we support it, if you all, if we all take that extra effort, you know to buy directly from the presses to support these fundraisers, it's it's going to happen. But you know it takes it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of vision. Thank you for that. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, I love what you said about initially about not one big bag, but baguettes, little bags, um, like, you know, bags to just, you know, make you have to make sure you're doing the work. And then kudos to you for providing the child care while doing the work. I know all about it. Um, uh, we're going to turn the questions, but I wanted to, is there anything else that people should know about what you're doing uh, at Kaya, um, the work at Kaya Press? Yeah, definitely check it out. We're, you know, we we have been around for a long time. Um, we have uh, we have new books. We've been doing a, a series of uh, books from Korean from Korean science fiction books in translation from Korea. Uh, we have a new book coming out called On the Origin of Species by uh, a Korean science fiction writer. Mostly, we're doing women and uh, non-binary writers coming out of Korea. So it's so great to to read science fiction that doesn't orientalize folks, uh, just to get it switched all around. Um, so it's really exciting. So do check that out. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's turn to these uh, questions from the audience. I'm going to start from the top of the list. Give me one second, because reading takes time. What about artists of color who want to begin their own literary ventures, but think, I don't know anyone? Where do they start? Uh, let's, anybody? for the urge to answer that one, or I can call them. Tara, how do you, <laughs> somebody, wait, hold on, wait, 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 Neela. Well, <laughs> Neela, you said something in the chat, can you, and then I'll go to Tara. The internet. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? Like go out, I find friends on the internet? I, mean, I like, think that's the great, I mean, the great equalizer. It seems like these days, like, you know, to connect well, I mean, with 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 people to be able to post stuff. There's so many outlets. There's so many great things happening on there. So uh, that's how I think, especially in this time. All there's so many so many people have been collaborating. There's so many places to post. Uh, there, you know, there's hashtags. You can can if you feel like you don't know anyone, then it seems like it's a good place to try to connect. Sorry, did you also want to take a stab at that or Tongo? I'm going to try because I want to tie it to this question that came up in the chat box as well from Violetta. Um, I'm very picky and choosy about who I do this for now, but in terms of organizing events and writing about other books, I do that and that builds an audience for books in a very different way. So even if you just <laughs> kept a blog or did mini tweets where you reviewed people's books or something like that, that does so much for people's books. And I think no one talks about that because there are so many young people who will do that. And then on top of that, there are so many young people who click up as a crew and they just promote each other. And there's been a lot of writers who do that and then they end up calling them schools of writers, right? That's basically what they're doing is they're clicking up, they promote each other, they put each other on for readings. And I don't really like to do that. Like, like, like the beats. <laughs> yes, the beats were notorious for that. Then, you know, all respect to Lawrence Ferenghetti and City Lights. I love what he did, but that's really what they did. And, <laughs> <laughs> for me, I've never wanted to be a clique. I've hung out with all kinds of people everywhere, East Coast, West Coast, Black, White, Brown, Yellow, you know, whatever. I don't really care. But I think the thing is, is other than social media, there are not enough editors, there are not enough reviewers, there are not enough curators. And there is money to be made in curation. 
like I do, or I have done before seminary co-op books, it's the local independent bookstore in my neighborhood. I didn't want to host open mics anymore because I'm grown. I don't want to go to open mic and promote for 20 somethings, right? Because they're going to look at me and be like, why is she here? She looked like my mama, right? <laughs> Which that's a whole other conversation about ageism that we really don't talk about in poetry in particular. But I said, I really want to talk about books that I love. And I didn't want to be constrained to just talk about poetry. I approached a bookstore. I'm not on the staff, you know, so they didn't want to pay me, which I was fine with. I said, look, I just want to promote and support independent bookstores in Chicago. And they were like, great. They figured out what my niche was. <laughs> So even though I had done all my programming for like a year where I would just do an event every couple of months, then they were like, okay, we've loved everything you've done. Can we use the content in the podcast we do for the bookstore? Sure. Then it became other people would come to them and be like, we need a moderator. We can pay this. Would she want to do it? So because they saw me basically doing the work they made sure I got paid for it from other venues that had the money to pay me. And <laughs> I wouldn't do that for everybody. I would do it for some people who you know really trust and value what you do or you value what they do enough that it fits your mission, right? Yeah. Tongo, sorry, I saw you initially lean in. Did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah, just, you know, build what you build, what you can with, with, you know, with, with what you have a, a good, um, a, a good example of that is a nomadic press out, out here in the, in the Bay, um, who just, you know, they, 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 it's, it's shout out to JK Fowler. Um, uh, you know, he really just one event at a time, just, you know, kind of, uh, pulled the, Pulled the scene, uh, pulled the scene to him. I, you know, I, I, I think you know, th th there's nothing wrong with um, you know growing through that, you know, growing through a strong ground game, or you know, doing the legwork, and then letting you know what, what, whatever access comes your way, whoever wants to pile up in the future, you know, down down the line when 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 it happens. But that you, you know, you can always make moves if you're not, you know, if you're not concerned, concerned about immediate gratification. Thank you for that. Um, we're at 607. We have about time for one, maybe two questions. This is a um, one that I think uh, is a very revealing question when you talk about um, people's paths. And so I want to pose it to the, the panel. Um, what was the moment for each of you all where you came upon an obstacle either in relation to, I'm oh, sorry, text moved. Uh, again, what was the moment for each of you all where you came upon, goodness, it's hard to read a text message that keeps moving. The moment you came upon for each of you uh, for an obstacle in relation to your publishing industry or your personal writing career or however you want to interpret it and how did you handle it? Essentially, how do you traverse obstacles um, and specifically in your writing career? Um, start with Neela. Yeah, I was thinking about this earlier with the bag question, but I you know, lived in San Francisco for about 10 years and I, I left to go live in India for a while, uh, right in 2010 and uh, couldn't, couldn't come back, <laughs> uh, did not, was not able to return because of the prices. So I moved, moved to Los Angeles just on a whim, um, and that's that's when you know I I got connected to Kaya Press that I had known before, and it was everything I'd done. I you know I'd gotten my MFA, I'd worked at, in media, uh, I you know helped run start Hyphen Asian American Magazine. It really felt like everything coming together, and I came in to meet with Sun Yang. It was a um, the position was initially a, a promotions position. Um, and I just, I of course found a little bit of teaching artist work because that's what I know well. Um, and I came in so excited and I had a great conversation. It wasn't even an interview, it was just like, obviously this is gonna work. And it was like, all right, we got $600 a month for you <laughs> to do this work. Um, 
and uh, you know, I, it was it was tough. It was it was crushing. It was like here's my dream job, but like, how how am I gonna make that work? You know, and I just you know, the whole way home, I, I was so, I was, I was really angry. I was like, that's so insulting. How could they even offer that? Uh, and then I, by the time I got home, I just kind of figured it out. I was like, you know what though, this is what I want to do and I'm just going to do it. And, you know, got all the other little <laughs> baguettes in order to make it work. And, and, you know, in, in about a year, uh, together with the board, they were like, you know what, this is a good fit. We want to make you managing editor and we want to slowly make this sustainable for you. Uh, but it was, it was really, you know, I wanted to flip a table. <laughs> I was like, this is not, this is not, you know, the vibe that's, it's not sustainable. And I think there was a lot of things that like, hey, they were starting out, you know, sending had run the press by herself, was not used to kind of trying to hire other people. So, but it, you know, I could have like walked out and, and never looked and I kind of felt that way, but then, um, you know, I, I, I saw the larger picture for myself and, and, and I made it work. And so, uh, but it felt at the time, like for, for an hour <laughs> on the freeway in LA, it felt like an insurmountable obstacle. And then I figured it out. Figured it out. Congratulations on that. And thank you for sharing. Tara, is there a um, defining obstacle that comes to mind and you think about a way that you navigated it? Um... I don't think it's just money. I feel like a lot of this conversation has revolved around money. I'm kind of glad people have talked about this idea of write what you want and need to write. Because my obstacle right now is that I've published books, I've edited books that are on good presses. And for some reason I keep getting turned down for my third book. Like it's done. Most of the book has been published in other journals and anthologies. And the, I send the acknowledgments list with it. I've had a couple of people forward my manuscript who have worked with presses intimately to the, to the press. And then they're like, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't fit. And I'm like, okay, you can't tell me it's trash because most of it's been published. So part of me is just wondering if it's time to, to shelve it, right? And you gotta be okay with that. And a lot of people don't talk about that as an obstacle. And I also feel like when you think about like an editor job, nobody talks, wow, that would be dope. Okay, I'm gonna get back to that. But anyway, <laughs> um, no one talks about how even white editors in New York City who are at these major publishing houses will tell people oh, you can't live on what they pay us. And no one talks about, they'll talk about it if you have them clustered in a panel at like Housing Works Bookstore or something like that. And they'll be like, basically you have to have a wealthy spouse or a trust fund. And that's why publishing stays so white. But then you'll see a hashtag like, you know, what publishing paid me that LL McKinney did. And you'll see these writers we adore, these writers of color who sell books and their books get taught everywhere. And then they don't get paid anything, right? As opposed to a white person that people are like, who is this writer? Like nobody's heard of them, their book doesn't get reviewed and they get paid all this other money. So we need to address, if we're really gonna talk about the money, let's talk about discriminatory bias and who gets what and why. Right. But if we're not going to talk about that, it's like you need to write as if nobody's ever going to give you the money. You need to edit that work because you know that book needs to be out there. You got to host those events <laughs> and hope to God, you know, that's why meeting people is so important. You know, if you're come and please, this is my bit of advice. If you're a younger person, do not walk up on somebody and be like, will you be my mentor? It never works. <laughs> if they do that, don't, I don't trust it because there's always a bargaining chip that they're going to hold over you if you ask for that, right? I really believe a mentorship should happen organically. It should happen naturally. I've mentored a lot of really amazing young poets and I've had some amazing mentors. 
I'm still really good friends with Alpha Michael Weaver for that reason. And the only reason why is, <laughs> is because when I was in my very early 20s, he had just come out with a book called Talisman. And I, volunteer, I volunteered at Guild Complex. This was probably in the late 90s. I didn't have money to buy his book that night. I showed up early to work the door, read the whole book before he got there, and then pinned him down at a couch because he got there early and was asking him questions about the book. And I was just like, how did you get there? How do you talk about this? How did you start to, you know, just ask? And he was just, you know, if you meet him, he's <laughs> this big brother and he's like, he has this really deep laugh and he's just chuckling because he probably hadn't had anybody be that awkward in public and just be like, and and yeah, Mr. Weaver, da -da 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 -da, right? But I feel like if you can strike that kind of balance with somebody who's your teacher or an elder or an experienced person and you vibe, that's the person who's probably your mentor. And that relationship, you can't put a price tag on. But don't go up asking people to be your mentor because sometimes they want a favor for that, right? Not that they're gonna do something creepy, but maybe it's somebody you don't wanna rock with. Maybe you just like their books or that they won a bunch of awards and then they're not a great person. Keep that in mind. Again, it's not about the, the money. It's about almost like the spirit journey. You know, it's like the path that you're on. That's what I'm gathering. and. Um, and thank you for your examples and sharing that. Um, Tongo, uh, before we close out, I'd love to know about any um, defining obstacles or as the um, optimists call it, opportunities that you had to navigate. Man, I hate to, I, I, I hate to stay on message, you know, <laughs> but but it, it's, it's just looking at the, you know, again, just looking at the mass reality right now, they're just like, well, well, I'm always in pain, you know. I, I just I, can can we consider any history actually being made at this point? Like, can, is it even possible to make history when when uh, in, in a situation like this? You know, um, is this is this even a you know is is, is it will it, will we make it out of here with something to brag about? Uh, if all I if all I have to show is is you know a, a cool little run I'm, I I might have went on uh, what what keeps me up is just like where we are as a people um, and, and where the revolutionary potential is you know um, that's because you know I, I take I take it all personal you know uh, yeah. uh, the end <laughs> well Tongo well to put it well to put it in perspective it's all an obstacle everything around us like <laughs> go ahead Tara I see you I think you're on mute no I mean I'm glad he said that because it's like we can talk about the writing but it's like what keeps you from writing and it could be that right that we're in this moment where we can't go outside safely and there were moments before this moment where we could not go outside safely right and then can you even be indoors, economically speaking? You know, there's a lot of more pressing issues that will keep us from getting to those higher needs of being able to creatively express yourself. And that's always gonna be there. Thank you for that. I wanna take the last moments to close out the panel the right way. Um, closing thoughts. Uh, I want to say thank you, all of you, um, for, you know, for having this conversation of high intelligence and high art and also just doing it in a way that's relatable, you know, like me feeling comfortable to show my four-year-old scream at the camera real quick, you know, <laughs> like, thank you. Um, do you have any closing thoughts? Please share them with us. I, I'll start with uh, Tara since you spoke last. We can go backwards. Yeah. I I'm glad there was a four-year-old to keep me from using four-letter words, but I will say that there are no obscenities in my book, but there are obscene situations, right? Um, I'm glad we could talk a little bit about that and that whether it, <laughs> it's the things that came up that seem to be obstacles or it's other things like 
healthcare or you just feel like you have imposter syndrome or you didn't get into this school or you didn't get that job, you know, remember what made you love it and want to do it, right? Because I'm sure Neela and Tongo have stories about wild things they had to go through to just get to right now. And I know I do. I just feel like you don't need to hear a sob story. You'll probably live your own at some point. You know? So don't take heart, learn how to manage your stress, take care of your teeth. I tell my students that because we don't get dental coverage. So you better floss. <laughs> you know, it sounds like random advice, but it's real. Can I just jump in? So sorry to crash. I just wanted to know we have 10 more minutes, so we could take a few more questions. Um, if you guys are all willing, I don't want to hold anyone here hostage. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I'm down. I, the calendar I had or the schedule I had said 615 final words. So I just wanted to stay as close as possible to the schedule. But yeah, if you have 10 more minutes, uh, um, I'm open to it. Yeah, we have some great questions. Um, like there's one about, which I'm really curious about uh, for everyone, how have you preserved your identities um, and within these uh, Within these spaces, how have you stayed true to your personal values and experiences and how have those experiences informed your current motivation to create literary spaces for other POC? That's a question from CS. Well, I guess if you wanna just, you know, give general advice on, on how you create these spaces in, in this current climate, since we're talking about that. I don't know if I have a, a more elaborate answer other than I do what I want to do. And if the space wants to rock with it, then good. And if they don't, I'll just be like, then no, it's okay to do that. Like we think everybody's going to pay us and love us. And I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> you know, and you have to be willing to accept that to a certain degree. Well, or say somewhere it's different. Mm -hmm. Neela, did you want to take that? Yeah, um, I mean, preserved your identities. I mean, I again, like I, I feel so lucky that I have been. I have never been uh, in all of the spaces that I have. I have grown my career in in nonprofit spaces, uh, working with 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 young people, working in Asian American spaces. So. I, I think those are so powerful. Like, I, I mean, I, I don't know any other, any other spaces. So I, it, I feel like be, by leading with my identity, by leading with my values, those spaces, you know, they, we kind of find each other. Um, and, and that is, it's what's important. And I, I think there's a lot to be said too. Like, I'm so excited by spaces like what, what Tara is doing in Chicago, you know, just, I think brick and mortar spaces are so important to people, I think analog books and, and newspapers, you know, as, as much as the digital space is important, there's, I think having those things, being able to put out the work in, in those kinds of ways really does get to certain people that, you know, we wouldn't be able to reach. So I think, you know, thinking through all of all of those things as as we come out of this challenging year, um, and not not forgetting about the the power of of that. Not back to normal, but let's go forward. Um, yeah, definitely. All for that. Tongo, did you want to address that question as well? Man, you know, I got to I got to get back. I got to I got to run this message just one more time. You know. <laughs> That you, you you know you 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 have to keep your identity with the people. You have to keep your imagination with the people, and therefore, you know you have to be engaged in in a, you know some kind of process, movement, whatever you want to call it. Really, a process of humanization, efforts to build some kind of self determination. Um, that 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 has to be in, in in the in within the synthesis of your concept of yourself. Um, other other otherwise, you know, you actually can be a phantom in your own mind. You know, 
Yeah, no, no, no matter what, how groovy, you know, you might write nothing but, you know, whatever art, the uh, art of color, <laughs> or whatever the, you know, whatever, uh, uh, um, you know, whatever your your, your mission is, uh, or, or or noble, noble mission is, uh, but you you will get that the, the, the what what the what the kind of American ruling class is brilliant at is actually absorbing criticism of it right and they have a job for you and a, and a slot for you and you can rant all you want and 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 uh, you know and rant successfully you know but you're not really um you know you, you're actually not even um uh, we, we don't even know what you can actually do you don't know what you what your mind can actually even do um, w without it being again grounded, really grounded in a, in a revolutionary process, you know, if I may <laughs> run the message into the ground, you know, uh, but that's that's and, and if and if I have any uh, 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 you know, uh, power as a, a writer or if if I'm slick with words in any way, it's actually because I spent so much time, you know actually um in, in, in engaged in, in anonymous trenches you know the case manager you know the program coordinator in the alternative to incarceration program you know the little jail teacher the alternative school teacher you know um it's it's from that from those efforts of humanization um you know, and, and only and even taking the gloves off into like you know real political organizing, it's 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 from that it's from that ground that I actually have way more music to make than someone who who just kind of has a, um, a a not almost a non-material existence. So go on. Going down to the first trench you can find, you know, <laughs> and you and the rest will take care of itself. Go ahead, get your nails dirty, get some dirt on, dirt under your nails, and like get active, as they say, get active. I want to follow up real quick, Tango. While I got you, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, while talking about being in institutions, Tango mentioned that you can dance with language or be held hostage by it. After undergrad in an all white comp lit department, I feel like I lost ownership and confidence in my words, sentences, and formation uh, and expression of thought for being edited so much. How do you suggest beginning to gain that back or set yourself free from that? Well, one, you know, so craft man has to just really just, I, 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 I say this five times a day, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that, you know, you have to just keep a running conversation going in your head, your own, uh, 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 your own dialogue about what is poetry? What are you actually doing? You know, there is so much, there are so many brilliant aspects of your mind that you need, that, 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 that you can get to the bottom of. And your craft is actually the result of the conclusions you come to about like, well, like, why is this line interesting? Or why is this a line of poetry? And this is just some, you know, you know, why is, why am I just, why, why do you call what I'm doing right now just talking? <laughs> Or woofing, <laughs> and and, uh, and 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 we call this other thousand words that I might have had that, that 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 I have to the side. Why do we call that that poetry? You have a whole lot of like you're in you're there you're you're just fine. You 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 have your your nature is 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 brilliant. So just poke around it. Get away from. Don't worry about trying to get you know like 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 just work with yourself. Put a, put a timer on two, three hours a day and just write till the timer goes off and see where you're at in three months. You know, this is all actually natural. It's all actually your birthright and, and, and it, almost an invincibility of, uh, of the mind. So just that, that, that's what, that's, that's what I would do kind of like craft wise. And, and, um, and then again, Find you a trench, <laughs> you know what I mean? Get down in there. Political education is, I, 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 I vote, see what kind of political education efforts is going on with like-minded people are trying to figure out like, okay, so just like, uh, well, what's poetry? Well, what is this? 
material reality what is this society what is actually going on here you know these kind of just critical conversations but you'll be just fine i myself have had many incarnations you know one and incarnation had one had nothing to do with the other i've had so many tangential lives as a poet you know what i mean fret not you can go all the way um you can completely disappear from your craft you 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 will reappear but the trick is just uh is 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 it's just time in just, just just put that timer on daily you'll be okay Tara just wrote something very beautiful. She said, Tango used to have locks. <laughs> many incarnations, many incarnations and appearances. <laughs> locks, cornrows, you know, ball fades. Different, different hairstyle for different man. mindsets. Come on, man. <laughs> and I love I love what Neela added as well, that timer. I um I definitely ascribe to that as well, where I um, sometimes I'll put up a page in front of my computer screen while I write, or I'll blindly write in my notebook and just kind of scribble away, but it's for a set amount of time. I don't do timers. I sometimes do like a Miles Davis song just for this one song, you know? Um, and so, yeah. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, now it's time for the closing thoughts. Um, and we're at 630. So if we can make it as tight as possible, um, I want to make sure I have time to shout out everybody who made this happen as well. But Neela, if you have any closing thoughts you'd love to share. Um, yeah, that was, that was so beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Just, you know, yeah, I think I, I love that I got to be on this panel with, with people who are creating and also, you know, taking that creativity and bringing it to your community that, you know, literally has really, really become been my practice in my my life. And I, I encourage you all to to jump in, you know, there there is we need we need everybody to to do this work to start your own organizations. Don't be scared. Just just do it, uh, you know, hold these classes, share, share the knowledge, you know, there's still photocopiers, just make zines, start small, you know, it doesn't have to be big. So uh, thank you. Start small, baguettes, baguitos. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, that's really what I'm taking with me. <laughs> Tara, I see you off mute. Any closing thoughts to add to the closing thoughts uh, you had before? Yeah, start small. I definitely think that's a great point, Neela, but I also feel like sacrifice the desire to be perfect or to be like some model that's you're gonna make some mistakes it's not gonna be like you know you may not have the budget you may not have the staff you may not have a whole lot of things but you can learn a lot by doing and as far as the writing I have an accountability partner who clowns me when I just stop writing for a long time <laughs> but they're my neighbor. We live in the same building. So we'll be like, all right, we're gonna get together. We're gonna write for 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour. And sometimes we set a timer, sometimes we don't, but we just sit down and we don't talk to each other. It might just be like, you need some water? You need a cup of coffee? Bet. And then we grab it and we sit down and we write. And when, before I went into quarantine, I did that a lot at coffee shops. I've done it virtually like this, where we just all log in, we put it on mute and then we go to work. So if you need that, that helps a lot too. But in terms of whirlwind, I think the thing that's been helpful in terms of support and the vision is not just that I had students and people who saw me do that quiet work that Tongo was describing, who, who said, we're going to put $10 on it. We're going to put $100 on it. And that's how we got to the money. But I did all this other work <laughs> before that, whether I taught them or protested or whatever I did to even get there, you know? And I'm hoping wherever the building is, we can get feedback from people who are where the building is. Like, you want to do a sewing circle? Mama, you got a space to do your sewing circle. We're gonna do a poetry reading on Friday night. Okay, somebody wants to play jazz in the living room. We're gonna do jazz in the living room, right? And if it's my space, I can do that and you can't tell me I can't. <laughs> so I think that's, it's small. It may not be, you know, like the Astor Gate space, but it's space and that's a premium to say we own that space and our name is on it and people can come to that door. 
right? So just think about that, guys. And I think these presses like Black Freighter and Kaya are creating those spaces. And thank you for doing that work for us and with us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and your time and best of luck with everything that you've got going. Tongo, any closing thoughts? Yeah, and I got a new message. I'm not even going to hit you with all, although you know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, my, for me, uh, meditation, right? Well, whatever, you know, that kind of internal cultivation, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, you, you can call it a spiritual practice or whatever it kind of, whatever, uh, whatever makes you nicer to yourself and nicer to other people. You know, you want to be, you want to be practicing that as well, because that's, that's really how you adjust appropriately to, you know, these various realities, both of contradiction and, co and, and cooperation. And especially down in the, in the, in the trenches of craft, you know, kind of a lucidity of craft is, 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 the, um, is, the, is the zone to chase, even more than inspiration, just kind of a, a sight and a spaciousness, I, I like to really see these ideas and, and, and push yourself and push them, you know? So I, I, would, I would add that to the diet too. So I really, really got a kick out of like whatever makes you nice to yourself and nice to other people. Like that's, I got too much of a kick out of that. I was like, yeah, so many things, but it's probably a glass of wine right now. But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, I want to thank you all for joining us on this panel. The people who made this happen, Tamika and, and Pavali, um, please like show your face, make sure people know who you are with um, with POC United. Oh, quick announcement before we go. The next event is on May, uh, May 13th. It's a virtual public reading with the theme of isolation. Work will be shared by Debbie S. Uh, Lasker, I believe, and Naima Coaster and many others. Visit auntloot.com for more information. Um, thank you. Thank you to Emma behind the scenes, working very hard to make sure that I didn't slip up and the whole Aunt Loot team. Um, and thank you to all the attendees out there for your questions and for participating. Uh, keep writing, keep reading. Thank you, Ken. And thank you for being such a gracious host. No problem. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, everybody. This was great. Yeah. All right. With that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Good luck, everyone. Talk soon. All right. Take, take care. care thank you. Peace, y'all.